Blog Talk Radio. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Hello, everybody. It's A.J. Bruno, back with a uh, special installment of the A.J. Bruno Show. Um, we're going to change gears a bit today, and my guest is uh, Bruce Jernan, who uh, is author of the book The Fog, uh, been a pilot for many years, and he experienced something pretty astounding, the Bermuda Triangle. He's seen a lot of things, a very knowledgeable guy in this area. So we're going to bring him on the show, and let's get to it. All right, uh, Bruce, are you there? Hi, yeah, AJ, how you doing? Good, how are you? Oh, good, thanks. Great, great. Um, so I was wondering if you could give us a little background for those listening who might not be so familiar with your uh experience what exactly uh, happened well the theory relates to the legend of the Bermuda Triangle uh, and that's been around since the days of Columbus he's the first one that uh, noted that there was something unusual going on in the area of the Bahamas that he was in he saw some uh, strange candlelight type of uh, light off in the distance uh making these strange moves sounds kind of like a like it was some sort of UFO and i've seen some of those uh lights uh, that are similar to what he described in his log and then he also had some trouble with uh, his compass uh, it wasn't working for almost a day and uh so do you yeah it was Sorry, uh, 1945 uh is when it uh really started to become well-known when the Lost Patrol, they call them, these five Navy Avengers, were on a routine uh, practice mission throughout the Bahamas, and uh, all five of them disappeared. And, and that's when people started to think that it's possibly there's something, uh, some sort of strange phenomenon going on out there. Uh, so it was in 1970 when uh, I had an experience out there flying my uh, Beechcraft Bonanza airplane, uh, returning from Andros Island in the Bahamas. And when I reached the Great Bahama Bank, I encountered this uh, very unusual storm. And uh, I believe that uh, this is part of the storm system that creates this phenomenon of uh, something that I call electronic fog. But I'm like the only person that's ever seen this storm. I call it a time storm. Uh, I saw the birth of it uh, just off the edge of Andros Island, just offshore. It was like a lenticular-shaped cloud. But a bubble cloud would be a better explanation of it. And... It was only like a mile long and uh, maybe 500 feet thick and a half mile wide. And uh, it was directly in my flight path. And uh, it looked harmless. I went ahead and climbed up over it, but that's when it expanded at this phenomenal rate. And uh, it spread out in the shape of like a donut, which would be like about 40 miles in diameter, though. And, and it forms almost instantly, and uh, it spreads out at almost 300 miles an hour. But that would be like an ignition, not not a 300 mile an hour wind. And mm. and then I got caught in the middle of this storm after it had built up to over 12,000 feet. I finally broke free of it and got caught in the clear area in the middle. But then when I reached the other side, about 30 miles away, I could see that it had continued to build up 
uh, way up over 50,000 feet or so, and uh, and I couldn't fly over it, and I couldn't fly under it either because it was unusual. It didn't have a, it didn't seem to have any ceiling that I could climb up, climb under, or, and uh, there was no base to it, so I couldn't go under it. But but then I saw where the other two ends of it met, which appeared to be on the opposite end of where it had formed. And then it formed like a valley. It met on the bottom first and then formed this big valley. And it, the opening was toward Miami. And I was about 100 miles away from Miami at this time, right over the Great Bahama Bank. And then these two anvil heads formed on the top, and it f- formed this long tunnel, maybe 10 miles long. And... It was aiming right for Miami, and uh, it appeared to be the only way we could get out of this storm, because if we tried to go back, uh, we'd have to go through it. And so uh, my dad was co-pilot, so he concurred that we should go ahead and try to shoot through it. And we were up at 11,500, and the tunnel was like at 10,000, so we were able to dive down and, and pick up speed because it was starting to close. And... And when we penetrated into the the mouth of this tunnel, it was maybe a thousand feet in diameter by that time. Uh, it started off uh, with uh, maybe a mile in diameter. And and when we entered it, that's when this amazing thing happened. Uh, these lines uh, instantly formed, and they were swirling uh, all the way to the other end of the tunnel kind of like looking down a rifle barrel and it was uh, rotating very slowly counterclockwise and I knew there was this uh, phenomenon taking place right then because the lines don't form like that instantly anyway it was uh, I believe I was actually uh, probably seeing something to do with with the fabric of time itself and uh, it was like a rip or a tear in the fabric of time, and uh, and I was caught up right in the middle of it, and uh, flowing forward with it in a positive direction. Fortunately, because uh, it was rotating counterclockwise, and that's positive and forward in physics. And it should have taken me about three minutes to reach the other end, but it only took about twenty seconds. And when I reached the other end, I expected to see this clear blue sky. And the sky instantly vanished as I went out the exit. And everything turned this strange grayish color. And I felt this sensation at the same time. And this was really the only sensation I felt on this flight. And it was a sensation of like a zero gravity and hydroplaning forward at the same time. And it lasted about 10 seconds, and uh, and then when it went away, I, I noticed that my electronic instruments were starting, were all malfunctioning, and, and the compass was rotating all by itself. And so I I just maintained that heading, didn't make any turns. And, and what I was in is what I call this electronic fog, and, I believe that it's created inside these tunnels because over the years I've I've seen many of these tunnels, but never quite this long as the one I flew through. But when these tunnels collapse, I believe that they will emit like a puff of this electronic fog, and it's usually up around 10,000 feet or so. And this fog, similar to other fogs, can drift around for many hours. What, what makes it different than other fogs is that, that it's kind of like in a like in a spear. Could, there's a doctor from Ukraine that uh, he's a chemist that uh, uh, wrote a uh, article about it, uh, had it published. Uh, he believes it's like a, a form of uh, ball lightning, but it's much larger than the normal ball lightning. Uh, and maybe less dense, and uh, he calls it a ball lightning cloud. 
similar to my electronic fog. And I was in this fog for just uh, three minutes, and when I got out of it, it electronically dissipated when these slits all around the airplane appeared. They were like cracks in the fog, and and they were all they appeared to be miles long, parallel to uh, to my direction of flight. But actually, that was a uh, illusion because uh, my mind couldn't conceive what was happening at that time because I thought I was flying through the fog. And there's been uh, many pilots that have flown through this fog before. And so that's what I thought I was doing. And uh, these cracks got wider and wider, and then in less than 10 seconds they they got so wide that uh, then they disappeared and it was all just blue sky everywhere. And I was directly over Miami Beach, and uh, the fog was nowhere to be seen anymore. And you see, that's because, see, the fog was attached to me. To me. It, it took me 30 years to finally discover that theory that uh, you're not flying through this fog, you're flying with it. It's, it's similar to like St. Elmo's fire in that uh, it attaches to the vessel and goes with you. And... I've been researching this with a scientist from the uh, University of Nebraska, Professor David Paris, and uh, he's made some suggestions and or some theories on his own. We've been on like three television shows together in the last year, and, but one of the interesting theories he's come up with is that when I got that sensation I was telling you about when the when I exited out the tunnel and it lasted just a few seconds well, he believes that that was the time that I was experiencing this space warp and and it's more like a, a linear displacement in space instead of time it's, it's he thinks it's really more what I experience is more like a space warp instead of a time warp because the the time on my watch remained the same as the time on Earth. But what's incredible, what happened in his new theory is that when I came out of that tunnel, I was like 90 miles from Miami, and then he thinks that just a few seconds later, while I felt that sensation, that I traveled about 80 miles, and I ended up just 10 miles offshore of Miami. And then I flew for another three minutes at the normal speed of around 180 miles an hour to reach Miami. And then the electronic fog dissipated when I reached the mainland. So he's saying, see, I traveled 80 miles in, in just a few seconds, which would be, uh, I think it's well over 30,000 miles an hour if you were to calculate it. Wow. And I've worked with a lot of scientists on this project over the years. Uh, the first one that I discovered, or he discovered me, was name was uh, Dr. Manson Valentine. And he was a scientist and uh, the curator of the Miami Museum of Science. And very intelligent person with three PhDs from Yale, and I worked with him on it, and uh, he encouraged me to always continue my work because he he claimed that that I held the the key to the mystery. So to hear that from him from several times, he told me that. He, kind of kept, kept me influenced to keep working on it. See, I was only 23 years old at the time, and now I'm almost 65. And then he had me in a, his book that he collaborated with, with uh, Charles Berlitz, uh, 
it was the second book. The first one was a major bestseller, the Bermuda Triangle. And then the next book that he and Berlitz wrote was uh, Without a Trace, and that's when he kind of exposed me to the world. And uh, the other great scientist I worked with was uh, Dr. Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, he was uh, a great writer. He wrote uh, Space Odyssey 2001. And he created... Uh, the theory of uh, how satellite communication would work. Uh, and then 30 years later, it, it, his theory came true. But he had a, a TV series back in 1996. And he got me on that show. That was the first time I was really on television. Uh, played a, a big part on one of his shows. And so he kind of exposed me to the world on television. And since then, I've been on 28 more documentaries after his. And I'm getting ready to do another one now. And uh, the latest scientist, though, is, is Dr. Well, he's not a doctor. He has uh, like three master degrees, though, in, in physics and Geology, and, he, and he's an old-time meteorologist. That's his real expertise. He was with the Air Force uh, Meteorology Division for many years. And now he's teaching at the University of Nebraska. And uh, he's made a lot of progress with me, uh, really more than any of the other scientists that I've worked with. And... Uh, but instead of, uh, like, the other scientists sort of help to make me become well-known, I'm, I'm making him to become well-known. And uh, he's determined to uh, try to make a lot of progress on this. Uh, he's got his students involved in it in, in the laboratory, and he thinks he's almost on the verge of being able to recreate this electronic fog in a microwave oven, and he's uh, working on, on getting grant monies and putting together a, a project to make a, uh, a remote-controlled drone with all these scientific, scientific instruments that it'll be able to take up and go into this uh, fog. And he's trying to be able to predict when this fog happens by tying it in with the solar winds. When the solar winds are high, he, he's noticed that there's been a lot more cases that have experienced this. And so his ultimate goal is to make this official part of meteorology, like on a pilot's report, and when they give the uh, weather reports, they have something called notums, notices to airmen, and warnings, and, and uh, he's going to try to see if he can make this electronic fog, you know, become uh, a warning when it could be in the area. So it's it's been exciting uh, working on this all these years. You know, it's, I've been doing this a long time, and it it never seems to get boring uh, because I've discovered things that. I, and we continue to discover things all related to this one experience that I had. And uh, it's the most documented of all experiences that have been in this uh, situation. And uh, uh, my father was a co-pilot, and we had a business partner with us at the time. And I, I have a, the actual gas receipt on the day, uh, December 4th, when we topped off the tanks in the airplane, and I've saved that receipt, and, and it shows that I burned uh, 10 gallons less fuel on that trip than I normally would have burned, and, and I had made that trip over a dozen times before, and I, I'd always burned more than 10 gallons than what we took on. 
and it would be very difficult to make that flight using the amount of fuel that I burn. Uh, so there, it sort of proves that there was a, a time discrepancy going on with that flight. So um, to tie it back to what you were saying earlier, uh, I've heard stories about Columbus seeing mysterious things, lights coming out of the water, that sort of thing also. Do you think then that this is purely some sort of a natural phenomenon, some sort of you know, natural mystery that we don't yet understand, or is there some sort of extraterrestrial involvement that's creating it? What do you think exactly it is? Well, yeah, it could be both. Uh, Dr. Valentine believed that it was probably a situation of, of both natural. From what I saw, it, it looked natural to me, although there were curves in the physical appearance of the storm that uh, maybe you could say weren't natural because they were like perfect curves. Um, but with the as far as the UFOs go, when I had that experience, I, I didn't see any UFOs but it was uh, only a month after that experience. I was flying uh, over Miami at night, and I was uh, at 10,000 feet, and I started heading offshore. And uh, the, my passenger and I both saw this strange light, kind of like the one... Uh, that I mentioned about Columbus saw that kind of almost looked like a a candle flame, and it was sort of bobbing around way off in the distance out over the Bahamas. And then uh, we watched it for a minute or so and uh, kept aiming out toward it. And it was far away. I don't know. How many miles? It could have been 50 miles away, way over Bimini or something. And then all of a sudden it shot right at us at a fantastic rate. And it was it was on the same flight path that I was on when I went through that tunnel and, and then ended up over Miami. And when it got close to me, I could see it was uh, like a saucer shape. And I, I had a feeling that it was made out of uh, some sort of metallic, although it was glowing this orange color. And it was maybe uh, at least 300 feet or more in diameter, maybe 50 feet or more thick. And it, it just came right at us at a collision course. And uh, I thought that... Uh, we were going to collide, and that was going to be the end for me. And I was just started saying my last prayers, but it's, I went ahead and made a real sharp turn to the left. And then when I, I looked back at it, it had vanished. But I've seen other UFOs uh, similar in shape to this one. And uh, this one did seem to tie into the that area where this time storm had formed. And, and, and once I saw like five of them in formation all flying toward that area too. And then uh, the last one in the formation made a, a a turn and uh, flew right over us. Uh, we were on the beach, on the ground. And it, it was going real fast, maybe... 600 or more and uh, but it, when it made that turn it uh, it had no curve to the turn I could see that it, it made a square turn at high speed uh, almost like a hummingbird can do but, I uh, I read that you think that there might be a secret Navy base in the area but 
You know, these sorts of craft have been cited for hundreds of years. Doesn't that seem to lend more credence to the theory that, um, you know, these are not man-directed uh, aircraft, that these are something we just don't understand? Um, yes, it uh, could be. Uh, yeah, they've definitely been around. I was just on that show uh, Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. And I've been watching those shows. They've got a series of ten of them this season, and they all kind of prove that there was aliens back then. But as far as I've seen, though, uh, these things—I can't tell whether they're powered, you know, uh, controlled by aliens or, or not. Uh, the ones in formation seems like it uh, would be alien control. And yes, they have been around a long time and they've been uh, spotted underwater. I've never seen one underwater, but I've talked to people that I've that have seen them. And the, the Sigrid base in the Bahamas, uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to. They've got uh, the one called the Autech, that's the Navy base. And they are very secretive there. Uh, I've been told uh, by one of their uh, commanders once told me not a really strange thing. <laughs> that he wouldn't give me his name and uh, or uh, let me. You know, I could quote him because he uh, he didn't wouldn't give me any information. He said if I ever did quote him, that he would deny it. But. Uh, but he told me that yeah, one of his one of their submarines there at the Navy base uh, skipped through uh, space and time somehow, uh, maybe uh, fifty miles or so, just in a matter of seconds. And he was on the ship when it happened, and that was pretty incredible. But they they do keep a lot of cigarettes there. It's highly confidential. But, but I had a good friend that worked there in the 60s, and that's that's why I was visiting there. Or, well, not just because of him, though. We were trying to to develop some property there. But he was a, a scientist for them, a young scientist. And, uh, he told me a couple of their cigarettes, but uh, none of them were uh, supernatural or anything like that. Uh, they were just... Uh, these these high tech methods that they had uh, developed for controlling uh, guided missiles or or uh, from the submarines, the torpedoes. So he didn't tell me anything about aliens or anything. And when I had this experience, he couldn't believe it either. He would he tried to interrogate me, but many people have tried to interrogate me on this. Uh, because it's you know it's hard to believe. Definitely. Now I'm wondering also what you you seem to be one of the fortunate ones to you know, live to tell this story. What happens to all the aircraft and uh, boats that we never hear from again and no wreckage is ever found? Do you think these people are still alive somewhere at some time? Um, well, there's if if you believe in ghosts, maybe there can maybe something like that. Around, uh, but mo- most of the uh, disappearances have, have just been through natural causes, thunderstorms or uh, uh, spatial disorientation f- when you're flying an airplane, getting caught up in bad weather, and then uh, crashing. And same with ships, you know. Getting uh, a lot of the ships, they have these. Uh, Freak waves. That's just recently been proven by a scientist from University of Miami. Uh, the, these uh, freak waves can pop up, and he's proven that now. Even in a calm sea, they can pop up and just sink a small boat. But there are there have been many pilots and ships that have been in this electronic fog, and it's with the planes. Uh, what has happened to m- many of them is uh, 
they become spatially disoriented and uh, kind of like uh, uh, John Kennedy Jr. It, uh, a lot of the crashes are identical to his. There's there's one right near me in the Keys that's identical to his method of crashing. And I'm positive that the pilot experienced this electronic fog because it was in uh, the same exact area where I experienced this electronic fog the second time. And I, I was with my wife then. And we were uh, flying over the Florida Bay and just when we got over the Everglades, that's when this electronic fog attached to my aircraft. And so that was a unique experience, but nothing like the one in uh, 1970. That was around 1996. And uh, I didn't realize that the fog was attached to me then either because I, I hadn't developed my theory yet then. But then I had developed that theory in the year 2000, and I thought back, and then I realized that I had experienced it then, too. And so did a neighbor at the same time. He experienced it just before me. But anyway, this pilot was working for the Coast Guard, and sort of a volunteer thing. They paid his expenses so he could fly his airplane. He had a small paper Apache, or, and... Uh, he was flying right there in the same spot uh, over the Everglades near Florida Bay, but this was at night. And there's another girl named Carrie Trantham that had the same an experience in the same exact area. I mean, she got she lived, she survived it, and she's been written in, in about in many books and, and been on TV. But anyway, this guy's name is Casey Purvis, and uh, I write about him in my book and. Uh, and I actually remember the night that it happened to him. It was perfectly clear weather. I was thinking, God, this would be a beautiful night to go flying. There were just some small little scattered cumulus, little, just little puffs, widely scattered. And a perfectly clear night with some moonlight. And he, when he, the Coast Guard was following him in their jet, in their Citation jet, and, and they played cat and mouse, where he tries to get away from him as if he was a drug dealer with, with a load of drugs on board, and he's trying to escape them. So it was just a practice thing they were doing. And and the jet was uh, maybe uh, five miles behind him or so, and, uh, and, and he says to the jet, they've got the transmissions recorded. He says, oh, what a beautiful clear night. I, I can see the lights of the city of Marathon 30 miles away, and he was uh, about 2,000 feet high. And, and then uh, 30 seconds later, he calls the Coast Guard back, and he says, uh, it's getting a bit hazy. And then 30 seconds later, he calls back, and, and he says, and he tells the Coast Guard jet, he says, don't follow me, I've gone IMC, which means Instrument Meteorological Conditions. And that means zero visibility. So he went from a perfectly clear sky with practically no clouds to zero visibility in a matter of seconds. And then he went through the routine, the same routine that JFK made. Uh, I think he made maybe one or two left turns, but mostly right turns. A right-handed pilot would tend to make more right turns as this confusion sets in. You see, his magnetic compass was probably slowly rotating the wrong way all by itself, and he didn't even realize it. And he's trying to figure out how to steer the plane by instruments, and it's not working right because the compass is going one way, and he's, it should be going the other way because he thinks he's turning the other way. So what happens is the I've never experienced it, but it's called spatial disorientation, and it's it's like it must be something like you get kind of nauseous and dizzy at the same time, and you just can't handle it anymore. And you enter a graveyard spiral 
which is a downward spiraling turn that in an airplane, once you've entered it, it's impossible to pull out of it because even if you try to turn out, it just increases the spiral even more. So he died, uh, and I'm sure it was from this electronic fog. But one of the strange things could possibly be if this fog is powerful enough that it may have the strength to disintegrate a vessel. And that could be why some of the disappearances seem to just be completely gone because they they entered this fog at its most highest intensity where it takes you like to another time and that's where I mentioned the ghost to you and that you asked me could they possibly still be around well there are some famous ghost stories about like the, the flying Dutchman I think people have said they've seen Flight 19 flying too wow so if you had turned before there was an opening and went through the side of the vortex. What do you think would have happened? Would you your plane have disintegrated? No. Uh, that happened to a, a young pilot in the 70s. And uh, he was with two witnesses, and they wrote the story in, like, the National Enquirer. I tried to track them down, but it was, like, 20 years later, and I couldn't get them. But he was flying a small plane similar to the one I was in, but he was going the opposite direction. And uh, the clouds built up, they said, and then he found this long tunnel, and he went ahead and flew through the tunnel, but he didn't make it to the other end. And just a few minutes, they were like close to Bimini when this happened, in the same area that I was. A lot of these things happen around the Bimini area. Flight 19, Charles Burlitz in 1928 had an experience there that he wrote about. Uh, and it was electronic fog, too, I'm sure. All in the same area. And so he didn't make it through the other end of the tunnel. And and then, it's just a short time later, maybe only minutes, he may have experienced some sort of space warp. And he pops out of the clouds and uh, he sees an island. And I guess they were all shook up, so they they saw a a road, and so they went ahead and landed on the road. And then they found out they were in Cuba. So this was in the 70s, and things were really hot going on in Cuba then, so they got scared. So they jumped back in the plane and took off. And uh, they were going further down the Bahama chain, but they didn't quite make it there. And, uh, and then the swirling clouds went all around the airplane again. And he found another island, and it had an airport, And but he crash-landed at, at the airport, and it killed him, but the two passengers survived to tell the story. But this, the second time that I experienced this electronic fog, I uh, I called up the... Miami uh, Flight Center Weather Bureau and I asked them how extensive this fog was because uh, I was it was an illusion I thought that the see the fog was just underneath me and not above me this time it wasn't this strong enough to completely envelop the plane but it, so it, it appeared to go on for as far as I could see you know 10 20 miles and so I asked the uh weather service how extensive the fog was. Did it cover all of Florida? Because you know, I was going up to Palm Beach. I wasn't sure if I could make it. I figured they were socked in too. And, and, and he says to me, well, what fog are you talking about? There's, there's no fog reported anywhere in all of Florida right now. You see, so <laughs> it was like it didn't exist, see? But it, it, it does exist, but it's just a small 
patch of this fog that forms around the airplane and goes with you. See, and I didn't realize it at the time. But anyway, I looked below the airplane, and here was this hole, like another tunnel, below the airplane. And there's been other pilots that have experienced this, too, in the fog. Where Martin Caden, a great writer, wrote about it in his book, one of his writings. And there was a hole below his plane, just like mine. And I was starting to get nervous. and uh, So then I came up with an idea, well, let's see, I'm over the Everglades. Maybe if I make a turn to the ocean, I can get away from this. And I believe that this is true in, in in a lot of cases here, that if this fog's attached to you, if you're over a large body of water and you head for a mainland, the fog will detach when you reach the mainland. See, that's what it did to me in 1970. And that, that's exactly what it did to Lindbergh, too. Uh, he was in it for like three and a half hours, but it, it detached when he meets, when he finally reached the mainland up in uh, the middle of Florida area. And what do you think that is? That uh, atmospheric conditions, the change in the condition to the atmosphere up over the water versus over the land. There, there's a definite difference where it probably just sort of shakes this fog loose. Another new theory is that uh, uh, high-speed planes like jets, very few jets have, have ever been in this fog. And, and it, it could be because when you're going fast, it won't. It can't attach to you if you're going fast enough through it. See, if you're going like three, four hundred miles an hour, see, and you shoot through this fog, it won't. It won't be able to attach to you. That's a new theory that a pilot actually gave me. That theory, and an old uh, Air Force commercial airline retired pilot, at a speech I was given for the. Military Officers Association of South Florida just a couple of weeks ago. But anyway, I went back to that attachment in 1996. This hole was beneath me, and I thought, well, maybe if I go toward the ocean and get away from the mainland, something will happen. And something did start to happen. As soon as I made the turn, I noticed that the hole underneath the aircraft was getting bigger. See, and I'm looking through this hole, and I'm watching the Everglades go by at the same speed as me, 180 miles an hour. And I'm thinking this is just some sort of unusual phenomenon. For some reason, I'm flying over this fog, and this hole is kind of like following me. See, but it wasn't following me. It was attached to me. And the hole started getting larger, and then, then I started feeling better because... I, I felt like uh, it was, maybe it was going to go away, and then I was able to spot a, an airport if I needed to land. And so then when I reached the the ocean, the hole had become so wide that now only this ring remained around the airplane. And that ring stayed with me the whole trip back to Palm Beach, which was like about 80 miles. And I thought this ring was miles away from the airplane because, see, I didn't have that theory back then that it's attached to you. And it was like an illusion. And I didn't realize that the ring was maybe only 100 feet away from us. And the strange thing about it is when... When you look through this ring, you would see a kink in whatever was in the background of the ring, like the clouds or the horizon. It was, you know, like when you look through a uh, camera lens and you focus it and there's a, like a gap of what you're looking at until you get it focused. Well, that's what this looked like, that gap, a kink in whatever was on the other side of that ring. And I believe this had something to do with time. I was seeing, again, seeing something that has to do with the fabric of time, that kink, that gap that I was seeing in, through space. It was like a gap in time. But I didn't experience any time warp. I mean, if I did, you know, it could have been a minute or two, but I didn't 
wasn't able to record it. Uh, but I can even remember this ring being around the airplane when I was coming in on final, and in, in only 50 feet above the runway. I could, I'm looking out, and here's this ring still there. But it, it seemed to disappear after I landed. But, but maybe that guy that went through the tunnel and, and died uh, that I was just talking about, you know, maybe he landed and uh, and it still stayed on the airplane. And then he, because he immediately took off again, and then. It, and then it came back out again, uh, got all around him, made him crash. Have you got any FAA or any government agencies to look into this? And if so, what have they say, said to you? Mm, no, government's not involved in this. Uh, it's We're just starting to get them involved now that I've got uh, Professor Paris involved in this because he's a uh, a noted uh, mainstream research scientist. But when you talk to anybody that's not, you know, and they're and they're working for the government, you know, you, you could talk to somebody retired from NASA, and it's a whole whole different philosophy. But anybody that works with the government, it's 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 kind of that confidential thing where uh, you know they don't want to lose their job. Yeah. Like I'm friends with. Seems to me this would pose a threat to the public safety. They would be. Well, that's what we're the main thing we're trying to do for public safety. Yeah, definitely uh, is to just save some lives, really, and. and uh, by identifying this, uh, especially the you know the electronic fog, uh, because I know there's been lots of lots of pilots that have been caught in it, and, and it's killed them. Where if if they were familiar with it, uh, they they may be able to get out of it uh, if they knew they were in it. But what happens is, you know, they don't, they don't realize that it's attached to them. They think they're flying through this fog, and then they start getting disoriented. And what if you were to turn off the engine and there weren't any sort of electronic instruments for it to attach to? Would, wouldn't that uh, make it go away and release or, or not? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh it seems like maybe the metallic of you know the engine is the main thing that would attract this because it it's an electromagnetic energy. So if you turned off the engine, the metal would still be there. So I would think that it would still stay attached to you. Yeah. Wanted to uh, bring up. Atlantis too, because you said a lot of this happens near where the Bimini Road is, and there's you know, been a lot of theorizing about what that could possibly be. Um, I think I saw somewhere that you think there's some sort of connection to maybe Atlantis being in that area and some sort of relationship to this electronic fog. I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. Well, Atlantis seems that it was there. The, the more they explore it, uh, the more they're coming up with uh, evidence that there were uh, ancient civilizations. Uh, and apparently there was one of the headquarters was probably in the area of the Bermuda Triangle. And so if if they were advanced at all, they they may have been familiar with this uh, electronic fog. Uh, I was flying over the Bimini Road, which definitely appears to be a man-made structure. It may not be as old as they thought it was, though. The latest I hear is it's maybe four or 5,000 years old, not, not 12,000. But there may be some new evidence of some other formations that are 12,000 years old right in the same area. 
and they've recently discovered uh, many more parts connected to the Bimini Road. It used to be just a J shape that they had, but now they've got a lot more uh, connections with it. It's Dr. Little, Greg Little and his wife have uh, come up with a lot of new evidence about that. And uh, I went on a, a show for the History Channel with uh, Professor Paris, and we took a, a, a twin-engine airplane out over Bimini, and he had these instruments, and I'm not familiar with uh, all the several different types of uh, instruments that he had there. Uh, but I flew him over the uh, Bimini Road, and, and the weather was clear, and every time we went over, the, got right over top of it, his instrument, one of his instruments would go all the way to the peg. And, I mean, he really got excited. It was on the History Channel. It was pretty funny. Uh, they even, he even said a, a word that had to beep it out. He was so excited. And uh, there was something going on. We made like three passes over it, and every time we went over it, uh, that instrument would would do that. Any closer to figuring out why? No, he was. That's pretty much unexplainable to him right now. Why the Bimini Road would have anything to do with uh, that sort of energy force that he was reading in clear weather? Wow. We went through some uh, small thunderstorms, and, and the instruments were reading, started reading high readings around Bimini, but not to the peg. I mean, it was really unusual. So there could be some relationships going on there. They apparently may have had some energy forces back when they had those ancient civilizations. One of the theories is that that's part of the cause of some of these time warps but I don't know uh, the, these storms can actually appear all over the world and I, I worked with a, a man from Indiana named Don Peltz and he was the uh, sheriff he was the head of the department of one of the counties uh, for the sheriff's department out there and he retired but about 10 years ago, he had an experience while he was driving his car, and his dad was with him. And uh, they saw this storm, and it was like a wall, a vertical wall, not too far from him. And it was kind of unusual, I guess, because it, it went all the way to the ground. And, uh, and then this spear went right in front of his car, right across his path. And it was just like a huge spear of what you could call, uh, what the Ukraine doctor calls the ball lightning cloud or a form of this electronic fog or a UFO, you know, I don't know, yeah. a flying saucer. But anyway, when they went in front of them, they, they felt something. And uh, kind of like a nauseous feeling, and and so he pulled over the side of the road, and then he watched it, and then this tunnel opened up in the wall of the cloud, and then the sphere entered the tunnel and went inside the cloud and disappeared. And then a few minutes later, they felt better, and so they. They start taking off, and then they notice it was like one o'clock in the afternoon when they had, when this happened, and now it was five o'clock. See, so he had a time warp experience. And so, here's a guy, you know, with all these credentials, is you know, being a sheriff and all that, and uh, he couldn't get over this. You know, nothing like this ever happened to him. So he read my book, and he contacted me. And he, and he said, you know, and he told me his experience. He said he thinks there's a connection. I said, well, you know, maybe you're right. I, I said, look, with all your credentials, 
why don't you go see if you can get the the radar images of what happened to you on that day because he knew the exact day and time and location but it it was like had happened to him like six years earlier and so he started doing that. it took him almost two years to get through all the red tape but he got the images and, and one of the images is on my website if you ever look at it, it's on, on the slideshow, but it, it's a still image. But I actually have the the radar loop, which is like a three-hour loop. And what it shows right at the time and location that this happened to him was that these donut-shaped storms, and there's, there's more than one of them. There's like five of them. He was near one of them, but... These donut-shaped storms with a diameter of about 40 miles instantly form, and then they only last for 20 seconds, and they're gone. So these are these time storms I'm talking about. And that's what can create the electronic fog. And this is in Indiana, and apparently this fog drifts over to the Great Lakes because there's been many people that have experienced electronic fog on the Great Lakes. I know one of them, uh, her name's Kathy Dorr. She wrote a a, a book that uh, she's trying to promote along with my book. It's, but it's about a mysterious place in, in, uh, in Peru, uh, similar to Atlantis, where these amazing stone carvings are up in the mountains at 12,000 feet. It's a gorgeous book. It's I think she's, she just linked it onto my... Uh, website and on Facebook too, because she's uh, she's self-promoting it. Uh, my book is published by Llewellyn, and the, the country of Bulgaria just recently bought the uh, book rights just a month ago, so now it's printed in six languages, and it's selling fairly well in all the different uh, languages too. So. Hopefully it'll be in publication uh, for many, many years. Unlike a lot of other books that you know become bestsellers and, and then they're out of publication. Yeah. Walter, important story to tell, and people should read up on it because this is, you know, this mystery gets solved one day, which hopefully it does. Um, you're well, certainly an instrumental part of it. Yes, that's what we're trying to work on, and we're making the. A lot of progress, especially recently, now that I teamed up with uh, Professor Paris. And, and his website is uh, is related to my theories. His, his website is, is is called the the science behind the Bermuda Triangle. But you can you can look at his website if you go to the uh, the contact page on my website. And my website's uh, BermudaTriangleFog.com, and then you could you could check out his website. It's pretty extensive, and and it's constantly getting bigger all the time. He is devoting himself to this. Uh, last time I talked to him, he said he was actually starting to get uh, kind of obsessed with this. Uh, I can understand why, because when you when you come up with the theories like he has recently, and it's like you're the only one and first one to do this, and and, and it's a, a feeling is is quite exciting to to experience that, and I think that's what he's going through right now. He's he's coming up with some theories, and he's a he's on a major quest to to prove to the world. That electronic fog is definitely real. Well, uh, I hope he succeeds soon, and um, appreciate you giving your input today. Thanks for coming on the show. It was a pleasure and an honor. All right, AJ, but thank you. It's uh, been great talking to you, and, and good you luck. Too. Good day. Thank you very much. Bye. All right, take care. You too. Bye. 
All right, that was Bruce Jernan. Um, please check out his website. He gave the address there. Um, also his book, The Fog. Thanks so much for coming on the air. It was certainly an interesting show. And until next time, this is AJ Bruno. I'm signing off for now. Thanks for tuning in, everyone.